Hey everybody, welcome back to the Revelation Bible Study. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas. And we are going through the entire book of Revelation. We are starting now at Revelation chapter 8. Wow! Revelation 8. I can't, I can't believe it, can you? I mean, that we've gotten this far in the book of Revelation. I think sometimes, you know, people shy away from this book. They think it's too difficult or too hard to understand or it's filled with all kinds of crazy symbolism, and you know, it, it is, but you know, if you just break it off in little bite-sized chunks and go through it slowly and take your time and just use logic and reason and just, you know, what you already know about scripture, I think, I think you can find that it's uh, a little easier than we, than we realize. So Revelation 8, please uh, read along with us. Uh, more bad stuff, more bad stuff in Revelation 8. We had a couple chapters of, of good and now we're, we're back to bad and I think these are some of the chapters and the reasons why people don't like reading Revelation. It's God's wrath, right? Revelation is God's wrath. It's God's hatred of sin. And I, and I mean that. It's hatred of sin. Yes, he's all powerful. Yes, he's all loving. He's all knowing. He's sovereign. Uh, he forgives. And yet an aspect that we probably don't teach and preach as much as we should because we're, you know, probably worried about how it might be received. He hates sin. The Bible says he hates sin. And we shouldn't downplay that. He hates the sin that hurts ourselves and he hates the sin where we hurt others. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Noah's Ark, you know, the flood. And uh, that's kind of what we're going to see again in Revelation 8, a complete judgment of the earth. Another Sodom and Gomorrah style punishment, uh, this outpouring of God's wrath. And, you know, you and I, I, I think we, we think about God so much as being somebody that's loving and forgiving, and certainly he is, but I think in doing so, we downplay the separation between us and God because of sin. We downplay our own sin. And if you ask, you know, the average person, you know, if they think they're a good person or if they think that they're going to heaven, they would probably say yes. And they would say that their sin uh, is no big deal. You know, and they would say, you know, I'm not really a, I'm not really a bad person. I don't do that much. That's, you know, I'm not super bad. Uh, but I don't think we see our sin. We especially don't see ourselves as, as God sees it. And the Bible says he hates sin. So, uh, John's in the throne room, right? He's standing before God. The scroll of the earth has been handed to Jesus. Jesus has been breaking those scrolls one at a time. He's gone through six. Uh, in the last chapter, we said that he was stuck on six, almost opening seven. And in uh, this chapter, he's finally going to open the last seal and the scroll is going to unroll and we're going to see its contents. Verse 1 says, When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. <laughs> 30 minutes of deafening silence. Remember the noise? We're in the throne room of God. Everybody's worshiping. Everybody's praising. Angels are singing. 24 elders are bowing down. The mysterious creatures are singing. They're all chanting. They're all praising. That last seal gets popped, and then silence. Silence. 30 minutes of awkward silence silence. Verse 2, Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. And he was given much incense to offer, along with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. So this is all Old Testament uh, symbolism. It's, it's Old Testament temple worship. Reading the Old Testament, uh, Moses times, you know, the temple times. Um, this, is, this is how worship was conducted in the Old Testament. Uh, the priests would light incense on fire as those in worship would pray. And the symbol or the image is that your prayers go up to heaven along with the incense. As you see the smoke go upwards, then you visualize your prayers going upwards as well. And so you're thinking, well, okay, well, what are they praying for? in heaven. What are they praying for in the throne room? 
But the passage says that it's along with the prayers of the saints. And you might remember when we were two chapters back in Revelation chapter 6, we said that those were the prayers of the martyrs, right? The saints were those who had been martyred. The saints that were crying out to God were the ones that were saying, God, when will you avenge us? You know, we were killed for our faith. We were, we, we stood firm. We were loyal. We were righteous. And, and yet we still died. So the prayers were, God, when are you going to unleash your wrath? When are you going to avenge our deaths? Verse 4 says, And the smoke of the incense, with the prayers of the saints, rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Wow! So that same censer, right, that same ball that held the incense, um, is, that, that held the prayers, now the angel goes back. After the prayers have gone up, the angel takes that same censer, fills that censer, not with incense this time, but with fire, and then swirls it around and hucks it at the earth and hits the earth with a ball of fire. As if to say, you know, here's the answer to your prayer. You know, when will God's wrath be poured out? When will God avenge you? Now. Here it comes. And you think, okay, why was heaven quiet for 30 minutes? Because they knew. You pop that last seal and they knew what was coming. You know, if you were a sports announcer, you'd say, and a hush falls over the crowd, right? Or you say, hey, we know it's coming. Can we have 30 minutes of silence? Can we show 30 minutes of respect because those people that cursed God, those people that rejected God, it's now their time. Heaven is stilled because God's wrath is coming. And you know, we think we want to be there. Oh, I want to be there when God gives you what's yours. We do not want to be there. To see people who deserve it get theirs, trust me, nobody wants to see that. The days of Noah, the Bible says that it grieved God that he had made humanity. It actually says that he wished he had never done it, never made people. He gave humanity a time to repent, and then when their time was over, he sent the flood. You that are in sin right now, the smartest thing you can do is to repent of your sin and turn to God while God continues to offer forgiveness. Today, you have the opportunity to repent. Today, you have the opportunity to receive mercy. Take advantage of God's grace while there is time. I know we all think we're going to live forever. I know we all think we have an abundance of time. You're in good health. Okay, but while you're in good health and while you can reason and while you can think and rationalize and you have a good, healthy, strong mind, make the choice to turn away from this world and to turn towards Jesus. Mercy is not going to be offered forever. And there will be a time when the sinner will have no more chance and God's wrath will come. Genesis 6, 8 says, But Noah found favor with the Lord. But, dot, 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 Noah found favor with the Lord. And you know the story of Noah. He was a good man, just man. Like the Bible says, found favor in the eyes of the Lord. God spared him. God spared his family. God commissioned Noah to build an ark in which he gathered his family and all the animals and birds uh, and, and saved them. Saved those animals. Saved those people. And it took Noah a hundred years it took him a hundred years to build that life raft. And all during that time, the Bible says he preached. He preached that people would turn from their sinful ways. For a hundred years, he was God's pastor. And he preached to the world and said, repent. Noah warned people that God's judgment was coming and nobody listened. And then God destroyed the whole world with a vast flood and only Noah and his family were spared. Thousands of our neighbors are so busy still chasing the pleasures of this life and they have not taken the time to turn towards God. 
there is coming a day when there won't be any time left. When you step through death's door and it's just you and God. And you'll give your account to him. And then we will receive the blessing or the punishment for the choices that we have made. Today, you still have the opportunity to choose to follow God. You still have the opportunity to choose to step away from the things of this earth before the angels hurl fire at this earth. Hey, there's no reason to love anything here. There's no reason to pour time or energy into anything here because the Bible says fire is coming. You're going to love something and care for something and pursue something your whole life knowing that it's only going to burn in the end. Before God answers the prayers of the martyrs, there's time. Take the time that's been given to you. I love you guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.